I just want to share my screen for a while. I did prepare, like last week, just a couple of PowerPoints just to show off, just to show I can do it, really. Um, and uh, you can see it, 1984, a totalitarian dystopia, George Orwell's prophet, prophecy of despair. Um, it, it's not a cheerful book, is it? But the, the, the reason why I went from Kersler to... Oh, well, just to start off with this, is there you had uh, Kersler talking about uh, the Soviet show trials, talking about how the Soviet Union, uh, how totalitarian, the Soviet version of totalitarianism uh, was motivated by the people who were driving it, and how Rubashov, one of the old Bolsheviks, literally fell out of history. Well, Kerslet was tremendously Im, uh, important to Orwell. And I would add also to Hannah Arendt, who was probably the most important theoretician of totalitarianism. We're not talking about her in the course, but she was, she was extremely important. And uh, in effect, what Orwell does in 1984 is in a way start from Kerslet, start from the idea of the actual totalitarians that had been... Uh, you know, fighting over Europe in the previous decade uh, and tried to take totalitarianism to its full logic. He was writing a dystopian view. I mean, it really is, 1984. It's set in the future, random date. Uh, but the idea is it can happen here too in Britain or in America. It doesn't have to be some Eurasian or uh, phenomenon. First point. And second point, there are tendencies in the world in this direction towards totalitarianism. And consequently, uh, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a deep warning. This is where we're going unless we follow other forms of politics. And the way I set up the course, uh, and we'll talk about this right at the end, I'll bring this up again, is I basically wanted to show Kersler the, the experience of Soviet Russia. Uh, or well, the, the logical conclusions of totalitarianism. And then two thinkers, Arthur Schlesinger and uh, Isaiah Berlin, who between them uh, started to articulate what an alternative to totalitarianism could be. There are other thinkers too, but I chose those two in particular. Because just as Orwell says straight away, you know, if there is hope, it's in the proles, and he gets disabused of this in the in the interrogation scene, which we're going to talk about. But in fact, many people came to the conclusion that the, 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 the liberals, the progressives, the former socialists that I'm talking about in this course, and which I hope I'll talk about in a book in future, they basically said, if there's hope, it's in the United States. If there's hope, it's in a social democratic form of uh, a, a liberal form of socialism, such as the one that was being created by the Labour Party in Britain and by some of the social democrat parties in continental Europe. Uh, and that's why I chose Schlesinger and Berlin, two Atlanticists, two, uh, two people who are trying to advance liberal socialist ideas. But just some background on Orwell. Uh, here you see, first of all, <laughs> uh, I'm sure all of you work very hard, but the first point is, and I couldn't resist showing him with his typewriter, this is the classic image of Orwell. He was a workaholic. I think this is one of the very first things that everybody has to mention about Orwell. Uh, this is a man who typed 12 hours a day for 30 years until he died uh, and smoked far too much despite his lung condition and so on. In any event, uh, you know, Don, Don would not find him a model patient, let's put it this way. Uh, the, uh, he came from a middle, middle class background, and this is me now being extraordinarily English. 
you know, lower middle class, upper middle class. Well, in Britain, we have middle middle class as well. And people can identify middle middle class people immediately. His father was uh, an English civil servant uh, who basically sold opium to the Chinese for his, his career and then retired to Britain, a, having, having really spent most of his life away from his wife and family who moved back to England uh, as, uh, as a perfectly respectable person. I mean, in effect, he was a kind of drug trafficker uh, on behalf of the British Empire. Uh, you wouldn't think it to look at him. He looks very different from modern drug traffickers, but that's what he did. Now, Orwell was a brilliant uh, child, and he was schooled at Eton, as those of you who may or may not know anything about Britain will know is the most expensive and prestigious uh, private school. In Britain, it's in the shadow, literally, of Windsor Castle, the Queen's residence. Uh, but he, you know, his family was middle middle class, and in those days, he really didn't have the money to go to to Oxford, uh, and so he joined the uh, police, the Burmese police, uh, where he wrote his first novel. His first novel was written about his experience in Burma. Uh, Burmese days. Uh, he wrote a marvelous little sketch called Shooting an Elephant, if any of you have ever read it, about his experience while he was in Burma. And uh, this is the first point. His experience as a uh, agent of imperialism, so to speak, of British imperialism, as, you know, doing the dirty work of British imperialism as a, as a police officer, and a very good police officer, incidentally, uh, you know, he was a crack shot. He learned Burm to speak Burmese fluently. Uh, there was, he was a good officer, but he became uh, passionately anti-imperialist and socialist as a consequence. Uh, and so he resigned from the Indian civil service, uh, resigned from the, from the imperial police, and uh, went back to Britain. And for a while, he was, an, uh, you know, down and out. He experimented with being a tramp, with living on the roads, uh, and wrote his uh, famous book, uh, Down and Out in Paris and London. Uh, but he quickly managed to establish a, rep uh, a reputation as being a somewhat orthodox intellectual. And you'll notice I've called him an English radical. He liked to think of himself as a socialist, but ultimately you can't get away from it. He is in the British and saving Neve's presence, also Irish, uh, tradition of radicalism, no? The tradition of Swift, the tradition of Cobden, the tradition of John Stuart Mill, the tradition of Tom Paine. This is where he comes from. Uh, more than any kind of continental theoretical socialistic uh, position. And right from the very beginning, his socialism and his relationship with the socialist movement in Britain is extremely unorthodox. Right from the, you know, his, literally his first book was The Road to Wigan Pier. His first book after becoming a socialist was The Road to Wigan Pier, uh, which was immediately, which was chosen for the so-called Left Book Club, which automatically meant he sold tens of thousands of copies to people who were members of the Left Book Club. What was the Left Book Club? The Left Book Club was a club organized by the publisher Victor Gallantz, and it was designed for working class people who were educating themselves. My communist grandfather enthusiastically was a member of the Left Book Club. Orwell knew perfectly well what the party line of the Left Book Club was, but what did he do in the road to Ligon Pier? Well, the first half he wrote about the appalling poverty in Britain's mining industries and mining areas, uh, the kind of areas where my family grew up in, uh, and wrote about them absolutely un, uh, without pulling punches about the squalor, about the poverty, not romanticizing everybody. And then the second half of the book is an attack of left-wing intellectual socialists who spend all their time uh, following what we would today call politically correct causes rather than actually doing something about the appalling poverty. No? He's, in other words, he managed to antagonized practically everybody in the socialist movement. And this was completely characteristic of him. And it's why, you know, we all love him. Now, the, 
Next thing he did, obviously, the Spanish Civil War broke out. Uh, now, many, many intellectuals in Germany, France, Belgium, England, Italy, particularly Italy, uh, felt the need to support the Spanish Civil War, with the exception of the Italians. Uh, not many people went and fought, but Orwell naturally did go and fight, and he uh, joined the uh, the PUM, the P O U M militia, which was a, a, a far left a radical socialist party, uh, and joined the infantry on, on, on the Aragon front near near Zaragoza. Uh, now. He, he wrote a book about his experiences on that, Homage to Catalonia, which is the first of the three classics that he wrote. He wrote a great many classic essays, but I think he only really wrote three books which are genuine classics, Homage to Catalonia, Animal Farm in 1984. If, if ever I had to go on a desert island, together with the, you know, the collected works of Shakespeare, I would take Homage to Catalonia. I think it's probably the, one of the greatest books I've ever read. And, and, and Point is, he was there, and his comrades were being were fighting heroically. They were getting killed, and then they were suppressed, and they were suppressed purely for political reasons because of internal power struggles within the Soviet Union. They were denounced as a Trotskyist party. Orwell himself nearly finished uh, on death row, like uh, like Kersler. It was a complete miracle they didn't arrest him. Uh, they raided his, his, the room of him and his wife. The, his commanding officer was thrown into prison on no charge, whatever. He spent the last three weeks in Spain sleeping on a building site, trying to keep ahead of the secret police. And then he went back to England and wrote this article and others, but no one would publish them. Because everybody said, you mustn't harm the anti-fascist cause by pointing out that there is this dissent within the left, no? Well, Orwell couldn't stand that, no? He said, that's not correct. You know, I can't forget the people who were dying for fascism. I'm not having them described as fascists when I know they were heroically fighting against the fascists. And it was a massive um, uh, impact on him. I mean, I think everybody who's written about Orwell agrees with this because what it really said to him was, uh, the, it was the question of the past. Uh, you know, you've got to be truthful about the present. You've got to write true history. Otherwise, uh, present politics can control what actually happened. No? And he says more than once, there'll never be a true history of the Spanish Civil War. And there, fortunately, he was probably wrong. But he was afraid there'd never be a true history of the Spanish Civil War because... There were so many lies being told about it. And this is what appalled him, no? Deeply appalled him. It also, I think, reawoke a certain patriotism in him. He became a pacifist for a while. Uh, but when Britain entered the war, when the Nazis, uh, when Britain entered the war, uh, he, he, uh, he discovered that uh, he was a patriot that he would fight if only they would let him. Uh, he wrote a marvelous little pamphlet called The Lion and the Unic Unicorn, which basically says is an attempt to mold uh, Britain's tradition with a progressive liberal, liberal socialist uh, uh, future. This was his idea. And he supported the war explicitly, working for the BBC India service uh, and as, as a broadcaster. It would have been an exaggeration to call him a, a propagandist because most of the programs they, uh, they, they, they made, I, I can't imagine that they really spoke to anything more than a handful of intellectuals. But uh, above all else, as the war went on, and, and as I'm sure you all know, as the war went on and when the Soviet Union came into World War II. You know, Soviet Union wins World War II, but it would not have fought if Hitler had not attacked it. Uh, 
Uh, you know, you have the Nazi-Soviet pact in August 1939. Stalin does everything humanly possible to avoid uh, entering you know, into uh, into a conflict with Hitler. Hitler takes the decision for him, and uh, Orwell went. And, and the Soviet Union became absolutely uh, had a heroic image as a result of the truly massive battles that it was fighting on behalf of the rest of the world. Orwell went uh, against that current. His socialism was always, because of his experience in Spain, anti-Stalinist. He was appalled by the Russian myth. Uh, he thought quite simply, what you've got is a terrible war between two totalitarianisms. I mean, I hope our totalitarianism wins and isn't destroyed by Hitler, but we shouldn't forget that, that it is a terrible totalitarian state. And this too brought him into conflict increasingly with people who like to pretend that the negative side of the Soviet Union just simply didn't exist. He became a journalist for Tribune, a long forgotten magazine, which was edited by the, Brit the British left-wing Labour uh, MP, Aniram Bevan. And he wrote a, common, a column called As I Please. And, you know, as the title suggests of the column, he managed to practically antagonize some part of the British left on a weekly basis by attacking everybody. They make marvelous reading, they're wonderful, uh, wonderful columns. And in 1944, all this fused into, you know, his second great work, which was incidentally owed a lot to his wife. It's very humorous work, and his wife, uh, who tragically died short, uh, before it was published, um, contributed a lot to this, into one of the greatest classics of the 20th century, which is, of course, Animal Farm, which, you know, won him rightly, in my opinion, a comparison with Swift. You know, it's basically the story of how the animals take over a farm. And it's a basically, as you all know, I'm sure, an allegory of the Russian Revolution. Uh, and it made him famous. Uh, after years of, frank, frankly, obscurity, his books never really selling very much, apart from The Road to Wigan Pier, which sold because it was a left book called Choice. Uh, Orwell suddenly became very famous and he had a, uh, started writing a whole series of famous essays. Uh, I'm just to name the two most famous notes on nationalism, by which he didn't mean nationalism as we would you think of it now, so much as what he calls the nationalist habit of thought. Uh, namely the idea that you attach yourself to one entity, be it a party, a church, a country, uh, a football team it could be, and that can then forth do no wrong. That ethically, whatever serves its interest is right, whatever goes against its interests is wrong. Uh, and he thought this was absolutely endemic in uh, the culture of the 1940s and in the democracies as much as, in many ways, as much as the totalitarian states. And the totalitarian states had been raised to a principle of state, but even in the democracies it existed. And he thought that this kind of unthinking uh, acceptance of, uh, of political entities and, and assuming that it's their interests of following the party line, correct thinking, was what more than anything else, even more than economic conditions, was likely to lead to totalitarianism. Moreover, he thought that another thing that was tending towards totalitarianism was language. You know, one of his most famous essays, I give it to all my students to remind them how to write their papers, is politics and, English, uh, politics and the English language which he argues that we've become too lazy, that we use words without thinking, that if, if you do not have a critical mind driving what you write, then uh, all meaning gets lost. And people, you, you, you live in this flabby, soggy universe intellectually. Uh, and, and this is dangerous in his view. All of this made him actually quite famous. Uh, 19 uh, Animal Farm, particularly in the United States, 
really took off, rather like Arthur Kessler's book took off in France, made him uh, a relatively rich man, certainly by his previous standards. Even by his standards, he was working hard. He was extremely politically engaged. And so he decided, I want to write my book about totalitarianism. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to dis I, I, I've got to get away from London. Now, Orwell never did anything by halves. I've got to get away from London. Most people would have bought a cottage in Cornwall or, I don't know, gone to the Midlands. Orwell went to this house on the outer Hebrides Isle of Jura without running water, electricity, and it took literally 30 hours from London to get there. The last eight hours being by boat as you came from the Scottish, from the Scottish mainland. Uh, you know, it was damp, it was cold, and uh, overwork and climate, the climate actually brought, brought on the tuberculosis, which eventually killed him at a tragically young age. That, I think, and smoking 80 unfiltered cigarettes a day probably didn't help. Uh, 1984 is written by a man who is pushing himself to the point that he knows he might die unless he finishes it. He wants to finish it before he dies. He knows he may die. He didn't know he was going to die, but he knew there was a chance he was dying. But nevertheless, he typed it and retyped it and retyped it and retyped it till he was happy. And that led to the publication of the book, 1984, which I think uh, was transformed in some ways in ways he wouldn't have uh, he didn't acknowledge. I mean, he always he became an icon of the American conservative right. Well, he always regarded himself as a socialist and as a supporter of the British Con uh, British Labour Party. He's quite adamant that he's a socialist, but he is saying this thing called totalitarianism exists. I'm showing you just how far totalitarianism might be pushed, and there are forces at work on the left as well perhaps especially on the left, intellectually, that can lead to this terrible fate.